Um, I'm sure plenty of you know Ron Cox. Um, Ron is an honorary associate professor of civil environmental engineering and a special consultant at UNSW. A uh, long-standing member of PIANC and, and he's certainly on the PIANC board. Um, so I've gotten to know Ron particularly well over the last few years since joining the PIANC board, but I've known Ron for about 15 years. I uh, met him at my first Coast and Ports conference in Melbourne and I've certainly seen him every time since. And an uh, important part of that is I, I seek Ron out because he's an excellent speaker. He speaks with uh, absolute conviction on things he talks about and I'm sure today won't be an exception. So with that, Ron, I'll hand over and um, we'll, we'll see how we go. So everyone on mute, please, and um, please do turn your camera off um, from here on. And unless you are speaking, of course, I'd encourage you to turn your microphone and camera on to ask your question. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, just as a, just a, an extra update, uh, I am recording this because we want to be able to put up the recorded uh, seminar for other people to watch into the future. So even for people who may have registered for this and they may not be able to attend, they'll be able to watch it later. So just so you all know, if you don't want to be recorded, perhaps you want to hang up now, but it's for the benefit of all the members of PIANC and the wider community. Okay, we're talking about climate change adaptation. So it all started for me, and I think for a lot of you way back in the late 70s, early 80s, the National Committee on Coastal Ocean Engineering we actually led engineers in Australian environment. The scientists were into climate change, but we as engineers in the coastal area were the first to really take notice of it. And as a result, we produced our first guideline document in 1991. And then subsequently, we updated several rounds of updating, each time adding an extra volume to the point where we now have three volumes and uh, most of you will be familiar with them. If you aren't, then they're a very good resource for checking through how you consider climate change in a range of different projects. There's a lot of little case study and examples in them. So it's quite useful. Um, along with that, Engineers Australia were perhaps a little bit embarrassed by what the National Committee had done. So they then really started to produce their code of ethics, even though there was a code of ethics when you joined, but they made it more prominent. Also a sustainability policy and in 2014 also a climate change policy. Now all these things are relevant to us as port and coastal engineers practicing in our area in Australia. And a lot of those documents, you would be surprised to learn that a lot of them have been picked up by people in other countries. Uh, by NCARF in some of the work that's done, but equally by PIANC in some of the documents I'll talk about in a little while. Okay, NCARF came along, National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility, a horrible, horrible simplification. And it worked from 2008 right through to 2017 in various guises with different levels of funding from different government agencies and different governments of different political persuasion. It essentially held the first climate change adaptation conference in the world on the Gold Coast. And it's really set the bar and established a baseline for people working in climate change adaptation. There's more than 200 very good library documents and research documents. Some of them are not necessarily related to particularly ports and navigation but there are some very specifically related to ports and navigation and climate change adaptation. So if you're not familiar with it, I'd recommend you go and have a look at the NCARF database, have a look at the library resources, and certainly take advantage of it. PIANC has been active in climate change through its Environmental Commission and the Permanent Task Group on Climate Change for quite a while, from the early 2000s. Most recently, in the last two years, PIANC Executive has taken the initiative and joined with the larger transport sector in attending the COPs uh, meetings. And that started in the COP in Paris, where PIANC made a presence and presented information. And that's considered for another up to COP25 in Madrid in December. PIANC, just before that, the new president, actually produced a declaration on climate change. It's only one page, 
but it's quite interesting. The first paragraph acknowledges very, very clearly that we acknowledge that the climate is changing. The evidence is unequivocal and it's time for all of us to reinforce that message and to upscale prudent action. It gets down to the bottom and it sort of talks about recognising the importance of climate change challenge and that PANC will do its best as part of the waterborne transport industry to address that challenge. So, I mean, so there's lots of high level policy documents out there. The first real, uh, if you like, toe in the water by PANC in the climate change area uh, was the Environmental Commission's Task Group 3, which was headed and virtually also established the permanent task group on climate change within PIANC. And that report, which I'm going to talk a little bit about now, looks at climate change. It looks at all the drivers, the various parameters that affect the weather and the climate and how they impact and interact with ports and with waterborne transport. And then look at what's the likely impacts, what sort of responses we might make and how we mitigate the negative aspects of climate change on our business. So the common platform, that P PT uh, Task Group 3 report out in 2008, it started in 2004, okay? So these things, it took a long while to get the group together. Of anyone of you who's worked on a working group with MPA, you know, two years is pretty quick to get a working group report out. This one took four years and it involved a lot of people from various countries. It's a common platform for all PIANC activities. It tried to be, you know, the, the, the guide for everybody. So, of course, that's why it took so long. It's based on the International Panel for Climate Change AR4 report from 2007. So the science is 2007 AR4. All the climate drivers are what you would expect. Sea level rise, tides, wind and wave action, ocean circulation, coastal hydrodynamics, coastal estuarine and river morphology, intense oh, storms. Sorry, sorry. Okay, so I'm in this uh, looking at the TG3 report. We were talking about the climate drivers. Um, we then move on to the impacts on the maritime and inland navigation infrastructure. It looks at potential adaptation and mitigation responses. And then it looks at navigation contributions to greenhouse gases and talks about what sort of things we might do to reduce the impact. So it's a mitigation effect in climate science terminology of the transport and port sector, how we might mitigate and use less or produce less carbon emissions. Now, subsequently, uh, there's a, an update of the climate science and an update of TG3 to incorporate IPCC AR5. <coughs> now, when you look at what's in AR5 compared to what's in AR4, and again, when we go back through the National Committee stuff way back to the 1990s when we produced our first guideline, which was based on AR2, all that's happened progressively is that the global climate models are getting better. So the uncertainty in the models is reducing. They're higher resolution, so both the spatial and the temporal accuracy and variability is better. The changes from the basic annual means in the breadth of parameters are, however, not great. So there's really not much difference. So the projections in AR5 for 2100 suggest a global mean sea level rise of between 0.4 to 0.8 and a greater frequency and intensity of extreme weather events. And if you go back to AR2, the projections for 2100 in sea level rise are not much different. They were maybe 0.4 to 0.9. So, I mean, we're not talking about much differences over time other than we now get better resolution spatially and temporally around the planet and in time. Importantly, and I have a slide on this later, even if the emissions of the gases can stop today, the changes in temperature, sea level 
and various other parameters would continue for many decades. And in the case of sea level, for centuries. Now, that's quite important. We all seem to think and look at this 2100 and think that's when it all stops. It keeps going beyond that. Little bit of negatives, which came out particularly in the NCARF research. If you exaggerate the change, if you try and scare people, it's actually counterproductive. People will actually see through the scare tactics and they will take less notice of you. They'll actually think you're just a scaremonger, so it's not that good. And also, the use of the word uncertainty, very hard. We as scientists and engineers can understand the uncertainty, but as soon as you start to talk about uncertainty with the general public, they believe you don't understand what you're doing. Why should we trust you? So it's an important thing to mention if you're talking about with the public, use of the word uncertainty is a difficult thing. So this is the sort of just out of that. IPCC 2014 AR5 started to be clever. So I produced this table which says, how do we describe levels of confidence without look, using scientific terminology, which is the right-hand column? So let's use common English. So they started to talk about high confidence, low confidence. When what they're saying is, we use the word high confidence when we're about 80% or eight out of 10. Low confidence, two out of 10. Now, what it means is if you see the word high and low confidence in a paragraph, you actually don't know what it means. It's a, it gives you a gut feeling, but it doesn't actually convey what we need to be able to do. The other one was standard terms for likelihood. So likely, I've highlighted, is essentially six, more than a 66% chance of happening, whereas unlikely is less than 33%. And in between, you've got all the rest. So you can understand. So when people start to use this terminology, there's a lot of discussion within IPCC whether this was a forward or a backward step. Trying to make plain English version without dealing with specifics may have failed. So if you actually get down to the nitty gritty of looking at the temperatures, increasing temperature, up to the point in time where we are now, you know, nothing much is happening. Then we look at what's going to happen through to 2050 and through to 2100. And we're now talking about with four different types of scenarios. Now they're called RCPs. I'll talk about that in a minute, but you can see with one, the temperature we keep it below two degrees. So we get about a one degree temperature change, which is the low emission scenario. We go up to the high emission scenario, RCP 8.5, and the temperature may go up to four degrees as the mean worldwide average, but it could go equally as high as five or nearly six degrees at the 95% confidence level. Okay, sea level rise, again, you get the same sort of curves. You've got the RCP 2.6 going up to the RCP 8.5, but with sea level rise, you'll see that the spread or the confidence limits get wider. So if you so if you go back, if you have a look at the spread for the temperature, have a look at the spread for the sea level rise. It's a it's a parameter that depends on the so the temperature is a primary parameter and the sea level is something secondary and the differences are bigger. OK, but these are the typical graphs and they all stop at 2100. Some of the graphs in, I, in the AR5 go well beyond that. They go out for four or five hundred years. But generally, these are the ones that are not published or talked about. But you need to be aware that it all just doesn't stop at 2100. So what's a rep representative concentration pathway? It replaces the scenarios. And again, within AR4, they had a low level, a low level of carbon emissions. That's still a low level, but it's now called RCP 2.6, going up to a high level RCP 8.5. And what does RCP mean? It's the radiation that is actually going to be there above present day pre-industrial levels at 2100. So it's saying that if we follow RCP 8.5,
which means we pretty well don't do much beyond what we were doing 10 years ago, the radiation forcing will get up as a result of carbon dioxide and other gases building up in the atmosphere. We'll end up with the radiating forcing of 8.5 watts per square metre. Now, again, is this, this is stuff that really made it easier for the modellers, the global climate modellers, but it doesn't make it easier for the general public to understand. You know, this is some abstract thing that tells us, you know, under RCP 8.5, what does it really mean? Oh, well, the forcing, radiative forcing is going to get up to that. And no one knows what it means. You and I don't even know what it means. But if you're a global climatologist, you do. So we just need to be aware that some of the things in AR5 haven't made it clearer for the general public. They made it clearer to the specific climate scientists. This is a good graph. I like it. And you, it's, it's just, it's a graphic impression. So if we look at over on the axis, the Y axis is just the range of uncertainty. So if we start off with greenhouse gas emissions, they're the things we can actually measure them. We can understand what they mean. Okay, so we can control them, we can try and reduce them, which is what we're trying to do with mitigation. Then we look at, okay, well, what does that mean in terms of greenhouse gas concentrations? And it becomes less certain in different places, right? So if we're in different, we're looking at different locations or different times. That's why there's two triangles and we're looking at the concentration becomes less certain. We look at global climate. Whoa, now we're looking at the whole world with the oceans and the atmosphere and it becomes even more uncertain. Then we say, OK, now we want to look at a regional scale. We want to look at using the climate models to come down to perhaps southeast Australia. Everything becomes even less certain. We then want to look at the impacts of that climate in that region, perhaps on agriculture Whoa, or runoff. And then we want to perhaps look at response messages for mitigation. So it's just an indication that it starts off, if we're only talking about greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, it's pretty well, we can control that, we can measure it, we can say what might happen. But when we're saying it, what does it mean for mitigation measures at a regional scale, the uncertainty has grown quite dramatically. Another good graph is looking at uncertainty on the y-axis and complexity on the x-axis. So if we're looking at large spatial scale, the world global co coming down to Australia or Southeast Australia, you can see that it becomes more complex, but the uncertainty doesn't go up much when we go from large scale down to the regional scale. But if we start to look at the mean values going up to the extreme values, which was what we as engineers want. We generally want to design for the extremes, the one in 100 or the one in 500 year event. We're not interested in mean annual values. They, they don't mean anything to us. We want these numbers and have a look at what happens to the uncertainty. It's more complex, but it also becomes much more uncertain. And even further, if we start to look at temperature going through sea level on the green curve, all the way up through wind and waves, all the way up to water quality and then impact on eco ecosystems, you can see what happens in that pathway. The complexity increases and the uncertainty. So if we're trying to look at what happens to an ecosystem in response to a coastal wind and waves and what happens to those ecosystems around our ports, you can see what happens. It's becoming very complex and our results are quite uncertain. We need to be careful how we interpret and present them. You see all these sorts of graphs in these science reports. So this one here, we're looking at, this is in time, so this axis, all these graphs here, uh, 2050 roughly, this is 2100, the middle one is to 2100 and the right hand one is to 2200. And we've got RCP 2.6 at the top and you'll see 
that not much changes in terms of annual temperature. This is going right through to 2200 in RCP 2.6. And you'll see, in fact, by the time we get 200 years out, it starts to look a little bit better. So if we can control the emissions with RCP 2.6, we can actually see in 200 years we might be getting a bit better. In contrast, you go down to what happens with RCP 8.5, and woo, by the time we get out, to t it just keeps getting worse and keeps getting hotter. And by the time, and it's going to just keep getting hotter. But in between, it's quite complex in time and in region. Sea level rise beyond the temperature, as we saw in the green graph, of where we go to sea level rise. This is up to date. So at this point in time, we've got all these records. These are the mean annual sea levels from around the world. And I'd like to point out to you that you can see that each year there can be variations of the order of 0.2 to 0.3 of a metre in the mean annual sea level around the world. Locally, that can be worse. So up in Oregon State, uh, uh, on, the, on the west coast of the US, you can actually get annual variations of the order of 0.3 to 0.4 of a metre in the mean water level, just depending on the ENSO and the other, other major climate drivers and climate circulations. So when you look at that, and everyone says, oh, the climate projections are just crazy. I mean, how can you believe that into the future? Well. The big problem is they grow exponentially, but equally, we're not showing the annual variability that is there already that we know about. So if you like, if you go up to RCP 8.5 and you get 0.9 of a metre here at 2100, there's also a variability on that of point plus or minus 0.2 of a metre, which is just due to the natural sea level variation with existing climate. Changing wave heights really matter or don't, depending on what you're doing. If you're running ships and you've got a real-time system looking at storms around the world and you're looking at your um, just-in-time delivery of products and shipping, then you know all about these world maps of wave heights and you know that you can vary your shipping path. You can actually find ships will actually change their travel path to avoid big storms or hurricanes or typhoons. But the interesting thing is this is the, the left-hand top column is the 1979 to 2009. Again, it's mean annual significant wave height. And you'll notice that the big waves in the world are all down below us around the Southern Ocean. The change that happens, and again, this is going up to 2070, 2100. These are the changes in percentage of the wave height around the world as a mean annual average. And you'll notice again, the Southern Ocean gets rougher. The waves get even bigger than the Southern Ocean and they get significantly smaller up in the North Pacific. But there are significant differences between the January, February, March, Northern Hemisphere winter, our summer, but particularly for us, have a look at what happens in our winter. July, August, September, which is the bottom right hand D, we have significant, again, increases in wave height in the northern parts of Queensland and below uh, in the Southern Ocean affecting the southern part. And in between, we get sandwiched with this little window of different, of reduced wave climate. Okay, that's wave heights. Now, when you look at that uncertainty graph, that's hard. Then you say, okay, the, the wave model has also produced these wonderful graphs of wave direction. Now, wave direction is even less certain and less reliable in projections than the wave heights. So take it with a grain of salt. But the interesting thing again for us is these are the annual wave directions and again you say well I'm not really interested in them I'm really interested in the variability and the change so if you look at the change 
in likely wave direction, you'll see quite dramatic changes up on that west northwest coast of the US where it rotates anti-clockwise and across on the Atlantic where the rotation is clockwise. But look at the differences between the seasons. The seasons are very different. So the lesson there is depending on where you are and whether you can take downscale modelings to a better level, you need to be cautious because that wave direction is likely to change your shoreline alignments. So the wave energy with wave heights and periods is important, but the wave direction and the width is the direction of the energy will be reflected in changes of shoreline alignments. Okay. AR, uh, TG3 gives you a whole range of lookup charts with a range of different drivers. I've just highlighted one of the charts, there's umpteen of them. It's a little bit like the first guideline document the Net National Committee of Coastal and Ocean Engineering developed. So you've got changes in frequency, duration, intensity of storms. What might that do? You may get degradation of structures. Will that affect, we've isolated in TG3 ports, coasts or vessels? And you've got a little box, you said, okay, so if this, is a, if this happens for where I am in the part of the world, if I believe the science, what might happen and what should I be worried about? It then gives you a range of responses that you might look at for those. And so it says, if you've got a maritime infrastructure design that you think might change with those changed wave conditions, degradation of structures, what sort of things might you do? You might have to look at overtopping and stability of breakwater crests. You may have to look restricting of existing port developments. So it gives you a quick checklist of things and responses you might need to make as a result of the changes in climate. A lot of the things, vessel operation, because this is a report for both ports and, nav and navigability and maritime navigation. So you may have increased waiting times at your ports. Ships may be delayed, they may arrive late, or the port may be not, uh, may not be open due to extreme weather. So there's, that's a major issue for port operations. Just to give you an idea, I'm not going to go through these again. You've got this complex listing of all the different scenarios. And all this is all these are just for changes in precipitation for RCP 8.5 for different times at different locations. And you can see the variability is dramatic. It's no different to CSIRO producing for Australia or the bomb producing for us a map of where we expect the water levels and wave, uh, sorry, rainfall to change. And what it means is, depending on where you are, particularly um, it's an inland navigation aspect, and it certainly affects Europe and America and South America, where they have significant inland navigation. If you have extreme conditions with more extreme floods, or you actually have periods of low rainfall with no water, you can go through the situation that they've had in Paris and in the Seine and in the Rhine River, where you've got too much water in the river and barges don't get under the bridges or you haven't got enough water in the river and the barges hit the bottom or have to tarry reduced loads. So either way, significant changes to the waterways as a result of rainfall. Okay, so the consequences and the responses of that could be deeping of channels, maybe raising of bridges, maybe putting in waterway design where you control the release of water, which they often do in the US Army Corps in the US river systems try and control the water levels through control of water flows, but there's a range of things. So the report, TG3 and the upgrade is going to be looking at this. I talked earlier about how important is the transport sector and why is PIANC now taking a more important role in the COP and in international uh, measures to mitigate um, carbon emissions. One of the things is, and it's a bit here, the left-hand 
the y-axis here is the emission releases in carbon dioxide equivalent tonnes, and you can see the contributions along up to 2000. You've got the shipping industry is in green, so we're pretty good compared to road. Now, road goes along, and by 1950, and suddenly it takes off. And then the total, as a percentage of all emissions, the transport sector, which includes the road, the rail, and the shipping, was about y axis, it's now the right hand side, y was about 14%. It's now up above 20%. Now, again, we might pat ourselves on the back in the shipping industry and say, well, it's not us, it's the roads, but we're within that transport sector. So when we go to the COP, we're, we're lumped in with all the roads and the bad people, but we're trying to do our bit and everyone's got to do their bit. So in terms of it, the shipping industry is looking at uh, bunkering to reduce burning fuels while we're at, 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 on, on dock and or looking at different fuels and different ways of reducing carbon emissions from the shipping sector. Okay, this graph, I think you should all keep a copy of this, perhaps on your desk or somewhere. And it's a little bit like the escalation in the COVID-19 virus, I think. Here we are today, 100 years is the first bar. What it's showing is if we can control carbon emissions, the brown line, and if we can bring carbon emissions down to almost zero or right down within a hundred years, the carbon concentrations will still go up and only stabilize after a hundred to 300 years. Temperature stabilization will be a few centuries. Sea level will still be going up after a thousand years. Frightening stuff. So when we talk about our 2100 graph for sea level rise, we're talking about this little tiny corner in the bottom left here. But even if we control the emissions, which is this is roughly about the scenario 2.6, RCP 2.6, our sea level, our temperatures are going to keep rising. So we need to be, it's a little bit like our health professionals telling us you've got to act now and act fast. But we seem to be dawdling. What does it matter? Why are ports interested? Well, we're all aware of the number of ports around the world. The big ones, this is an old one that I just took from Hansen 2011 at the 20 major ports around the world. But these are ones that he has identified have exposed assets with future climate change. Okay, so they're quite, we don't rate because we're not big enough. And in fact, most of our ports other than up in the Northwest and the Northern part of Australia don't necessarily have too much of a problem with climate change, but it is of concern to everybody. Okay, PIANC, Envicom, Permanent Cast Group on Climate Change. We actually developed an action plan in 2017. The action plan in 2017 was to form, first of all, a navigating climate change, a navigating a changing climate group of people from industry. And that group was established under the auspices of PIANC and it exists now and you can go to their website, just navclimate at piank.org and you can find it on the PIANC website. So that was raising awareness and getting the dredging companies and the major shipping industries, the pilots and everyone involved all together in a room talking about what we can do to change, to manage climate change. Updating the Climate Change 2G3 report, producing a report, a working group report on low carbon infrastructure and operations, that's working group 188, that was produced and finalised in April 2019. Looking at environmental risk management, Working Group 175 report was produced in October 2019. Working Group 178, which is an adapt climate adaptation report, was only out in January 2020. 
and there's a working group report on resilience in the port and navigations, which is almost final. Uh, there was a few glitches with a few sections being changed. And we've also always got the working group 176 working with nature of September 2018, trying to help us identify ways of working in better ways. So all the different working group reports, so anyone who's a member of PAN can get them, download them for free, uh, take advantage of it, get them, keep them electronically, use them in your library. Okay, working group 178 came out in January this year. Uh, Jan Brook was the member of the, she's now the chair of the permanent task group on climate change. She mentored that working group over a two or three year period with various changes in direction. And again, being the chair and being the mentor of a working group is difficult. And Jan finally got the thing finished in January 2020. It's been published. And this is some pre-work she actually presented. I've used it just to give you an idea of what's in that report. If you haven't read it, I'd recommend you do. It's a little bit like the National Committee Guideline documents. There's lots of checklists, little prompters, um, graphs and things to read through to actually help you think through the problem and how to do a better job. So why do it? It's pretty obvious. Uh, we looked at that chart. Go back to that chart about if we don't start now, how bad is it going to be? And I think for all of us now, we've seen what's happening with this virus around the world. And I think this graph is, we could probably change it to one of the graphs on what's happened with different countries in responding to the virus. You don't do it, you don't worry about it, or you do. Uh, I think everyone knows the answer. And we should be more forceful on what we should need to do for climate change. It adopts, and it's no different to a lot of the stuff in climate adaptation. If you read any of the adaptation reports from NCARF, they have this circular program that maybe have five stages. Jan and the team managed to run it and they just said, let's keep it to four. You start off with one, you go through your progress as you go through. And at each stage, you go back to the middle and say, do we know enough to go to the next stage? <coughs> or do we go back, pause a little bit and start again? By the time you finish, you actually have to monitor and you don't stop when you get to the end. It's actually an ongoing process with constant evaluation and monitoring um, and re-evaluation. It doesn't end. The adaptation process does not end. It keeps going. So it's it's a fairly, it's for in climate adaptation, it's a consistent approach. It's nothing innovative. It's got four stages. Some of the climate adaptation has five, but it's consistent and it's well written and it's easy to follow. It actually has for the stage one, and I'll just give you an idea. It actually says, what do you need to do in this stage? Engage with stakeholders very early, develop your goals. I mean, this is all obvious to anyone undertaking a project. Prepare your inventory, establish the roles and set objectives. But what I really like about the report is it actually has this nice little section called don't forget. Right. And some of the best advice you get is in the don't, for, don't forget little listings. Right. Like objectives should reflect the acceptable level of risk. You need to clearly discuss with your stakeholders and developing your goals. What is an acceptable level of risk for your particular project? Okay, it goes to climate related impacts. This is where you assess and understand all the, the, the morphology <coughs> and the climate. You assess the critical assets. You understand the science and you implement some monitoring. Okay, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. Stage three, a risk assessment, examination of options, and then a, cho a choice based on reducing the risks and how you might proceed with actions. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll just have a glass of water. Stage four, you actually get 
full ahead with your adaptation measures. And this is the point where you actually have to look at, obviously, low regrets measures, win-win low regrets, something that you know is going to take you in the right direction, doesn't cost much, and you can do it quickly. Always is obviously one of the first things you want to do. Retrofitting can be costly. So if you're building a new project, make sure that what you decide to proceed with can be upgraded into the future. It's no good building yourself into a corner where you build a Rolls-Royce structure that can't be modified or adapted. Okay, so when do you act? Range of ideas, develop the monitoring program straight away. Don't forget to monitor your asset condition, a standard asset appraisal for all your assets. Collect data. These days, the real-time monitoring and early warning systems are much easier to put in with all the availability of drones and new technology. Record the impacts that support the business case. Okay, monitoring doesn't need to be sophisticated. It doesn't have to be drones. It doesn't have to be Rolls Royce. It can be just fit for purpose. If you understand having done your first two or three stages, you may understand that you don't need to do much more than some basic monthly or annual monitoring. Okay, prioritize maintenance. So don't build the Rolls Royce build something, get started, watch what happens, and then make sure you can modify it and or maintain it into the future. Key messages, do what you can and prepare for what you can't. Promote adaptive management and flexibility. Engage all stakeholders for integration and review the business case and investment financial criteria and facilitate information exchange and good practice with yourself, with the stakeholders and with other colleagues. Okay, now <clears throat> very quickly, um, this is some stuff that I started to see and I just want, a lot of people may have heard my talk in uh, Coast and Ports, but uh, in Hobart last year, but I just want to finish off with this as information for people that the world changed not only with the virus but with the big what you know short got in trouble calling it the big end of town but essentially it's the people who control the world money the big investment houses the big lenders uh, it started off with BlackRock uh, they were the ones that started to say to people we won't lend you money unless you can show to us and your shareholders that you're not gonna leave us with stranded assets by taking risks with future climate change. That's how it started. By 2016, 17, they had most of the big people, they had Moody's, they had Standard and Poor's, they had a lot of the big investment houses already involved in a group. And by December, 2017, APRA, the executive board member, Jeff Summerhays, in a statement made to the Stock Exchange and others, made it very clear that from this time on, APRA would be watching major CEOs and boards to make sure that they were properly considering climate change in major investment decisions. <coughs> and they developed a task force the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, and they have set a standard. They've always got a metric fill in the form checklist. Give us information and you should be able to show back to us that on every major investment decision, you have used this to make sure you've considered climate change and you can satisfy us. Now you don't, you can still decide to do something, but we just wanna make sure that you have considered climate change and the implications on your business and the investments. Now, back then, there was over 100 companies in Australia. This was December 2017, with capitalisation of over $3 trillion. All the big superannuation companies, a lot of people who control all the money. I went to a workshop. Um, Ed Curiel <coughs> was there from Manning Hydraulics Lab. I think we were about the only two engineers in the business in the meeting there. 
There was over 100 bankers, investors, CEOs, lawyers, insurers, and and they were there because it was serious. APRA was saying to them, if you don't do this properly, we will fine you lots of money. And if you don't do it properly, we may even have criminal penalties for you, which means you might as a CEO or board member go to jail for a little while. That got their attention. So for us in ports, although it's not necessarily directly involved us, but if you've got a port that has a board, they would actually be under these requirements as well. A uh, good little talk you can actually get from the NCAF conference in Melbourne in May 2018 from Sarah Barker. Sarah starts off her talk and frightens everybody to death in the first two slides and says, you can go to jail, you can lose your business if you don't do this properly. So that's her talk. Um, it's pretty, and it virtually says the fiduciary duty and legal risk is there and you need to be aware of it and you need to act on behalf of it. Now, the same thing, the Global World Economic Forum, it produced its, if you like, its risk along the bottom axis here. It's a pretty hard to read graph, but I couldn't get a better quality picture of it. Up on the Y axis is impact. So you've got impact. These are, this is the World Economic Forum worried about what might impact the world economy. So likelihood along the bottom, impact on here. And what are the three things up here, which is, most likely to have major impact. And they are extreme events, natural disasters, and the third one up here is failing to mitigate or adapt to climate change. Whoa. So this is all the stuff we've been talking about today and the, even the World Economic Forum had it all up there. Now, it's interesting that weapons of mass destruction was over here. Major impact, but not considered very likely. This one down here, guess what? It's coronavirus. It was considered as a major disease outbreak, infectious disease outbreak, to have less impact than weapons of mass destruction, less impact than dealing with climate change, and less likely. But so quickly has that probably moved way up here. But things change quickly. So IGCC by October 2019, this is less than two years later, the Climate Action 100 Plus. Now they called it the Climate Action 100, and then they had to add a 100 plus because there's now about, by October 2019, there was 370 global investors controlling 35 trillion US dollars. And they published their report. And again, they are putting the emphasis on CEOs and boards to properly consider climate change in all their decisions. Okay, so their reports stress, and in simple terminology, and this came out of the IGCC work, um, Investment Group for Climate Change in Australia, Scenario analysis and stress testing. So this is, if you like, in simple terminology for board members, what do we need to do to consider climate change? We need to ask, what if? How do we deal with it? What if? What could go wrong? Uh, you know, what sort of level of certainty do we have that that's as far as it's going to rise? If it keeps going, what are we going to do? And always as we were when we had the Pasha Bulka run aground at Newcastle Port, we need to recognise in our industry, accidents can still happen, no matter how well prepared we are. And that's where I'll stop. Okay, Luke or Joel, have you got questions? Just uh, turn yourself uh, on, on, on here for a minute. Yeah. Um, um, Joel can Joel see the can chat, see the I chat. can't. Um, so I'll, so I'll, 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 I'll let Joel run I'll the questions, Joel if, run that's the okay. questions if that's okay. Yeah. I'm just aware that I'm getting feedback from myself, so I'm not sure if um, anyone's uh, where that's coming from, but it seems to have gone now. Um, uh, Joel, before I hand over to you, I just firstly thanks, Ron. I think that was excellent. Obviously, a lot of material to get through, and I know you've got a lot more that we can cover. We might even have to do this as a two-part series, and um, it's been very well supported. We've had more than 100 people, up over 120 for a lot of it. 
So it's a, clearly a topic that's got a lot of keen interest. But um, Joel, I'll hand over to you just to see if you've got um, much brewing in the in the chat. Thanks, Luke, and thanks again, Ron. Um, so we've got a question here from Monique Draycott. Uh, what's happening behind the scenes with the p working groups to either develop the existing documents or create new ones when the need arises? Okay, you can hear me? Yep. Yep, okay. Um, Monique, um, the process, and again, it's the different commissions within p in their normal working life, meet two times or maybe more a year and members of the commissions in response to perhaps ideas or demands or requests from members of their national sections may take to that commission an idea that says we need a working group to look at this particular aspect and then that member would put that argument to that commission the commission might then say, OK, great idea. You come forward and develop a term, a series, a terms of reference for that working group. The commission will then, after working on the terms of reference, which may take three months, they will then put that terms of reference through as a recommendation to the executive committee of PIANC, who will then say yes or no, go ahead and do that. The advantage of that is that that commission, then the ex the executive committee then compares that request to what all the other commissions are doing. It could be quite, it's quite possible that three commissions come up with the same idea all at the same time. So you don't want three terms of reference on the same topic. So you've got to blend and make sure. Once the terms of reference and the working group is decided to be worthwhile, they will put out a request for people to join the working group based on the terms of reference. And then each national section can nominate a member to the working group, and they can also have a YP, a young professional member. And then that working group assembles, they elect a chair, and then they start working. And usually it takes about two years, two and a half years to complete the process and publish the working group report. So um, folks, if anyone has any questions, just uh, write them into the chat. Um, if someone, has asked a question that you'd also like asked. You can you can just like it rather than typing out the same thing again. Um, Ryan, I'll throw in a question from myself. Um, from what you've seen in terms of um, what ports in Australia and New Zealand are doing, um, I guess how do you see the state of of our climate adaptation for Australia and New Zealand ports? Um, sort of how advanced is the work that we're doing um, down here compared to the rest of the world? Um, I think the Again, I'd say to people that if you haven't seen it and if you can't find it, um, uh, RMIT won a contract from under the NCARF research funding to look at port resilience. So it was a four volume series of reports on resilience of ports with climate change and adapting ports to maintain resilience. Uh, that's a good report series. Um, if you haven't read it, it's got a lot of good information and good ideas in there. It used as case studies um, Port Botany, Port Kembla, and Gladstone. So they were they were three case studies that were involved within that, and the ports cooperated with the research that was undertaken to look at that. So I mean, mostly it came up with the idea that most of the ports, and again I've got a, you know, no Northwest Shelf ports, sorry, you West Australians. So that uh, the work was done by RMIT out of Melbourne. Uh, it involved various uh, ports on the East Coast. Uh, Gladstone was there, Port Botany and Port Kembla. Now, for those ports, their biggest risk or they saw their biggest uh, impact from climate change being uh, changes in extreme weather. It wasn't. I mean, it was. It was. It was quite clearly. It was changes in extreme weather uh, impacting on the operation and particularly on the both the land side and the seaside supply chains. And now I don't think that's dissimilar to many ports around the world at the moment. Sea level rise wasn't seen as a major issue for them because most of them 
when they've done their upgrades or built more expansion or put new docks in or new berths in, the design has already allowed for climate change. And, and because of the National Committee guideline work back in 1990, most new port or any new developments on the coast or in ports around Australia has already been considering sea level rise and climate change in the design and implementation work for more than 30 years. Okay, so we've got a question from Anthony Foland, which I think is probably along the same lines as the one I've just asked. Anthony, if there's something you wanted to add to your question, um, maybe just write a new um, new question there. We've got a question from Reuben Cohen. Uh, lots of good resilience and adaptation here. What role does PIANC and the sector generally have in mitigation rather than adaptation? Um, up until COP24, three in Paris, very little. It was all, all the climate change work was very much focused on um, the TG3 report, which only had a small bit around about the impact of mitigation. Subsequently to that, when uh, PAN got involved with the transport sector in COP in Paris, and the transport sector, including the shipping, made promises about doing better things in regard to reducing its carbon emissions. Um, there started to be work. And then that working group, you've also got that working group 188 on carbon. That is a specific response to that deficiency. We've been worried about the adaptation side, but that has been a major response. You also see some of the working group reports that are coming out from Marcom and from INCOM, the Inland Commission, looking at better ways of manage fuel load and carbon emissions and bunkering. So there's a fair bit of work going on in that area, but it's only been going on in the last three to four years. Okay, a couple more questions here. One from uh, Ronald Sarley. Hey, Ron, are you aware of any ports specific indicators for exposure, sensitivity and adaptive capacity used for qualitative vulnerability assessments in Australia? Um, again, that RMIT work actually had some guidelines for creating those sort of vulnerability uh, metrics. Um, I know that some of the ports have developed their own. And I also believe that the there is a uh, working group report TG193 on resilience, which is nearly out, and it's got some extremely good metrics for developing the sort of things that he's asked for. Okay. Um... Question here from Harry Sinarco. What are your thoughts on Infrastructure Australia listing of coastal inundation protection strategy as one of its high priority initiatives? <laughs> Dear. Uh, yes. Um, I guess it's what the public sees as a concern. Um, I actually haven't read it in detail, but um, I think we get too much focus, and again, our laboratory, Water Research Laboratory, it's on the bottom of all my slides, was made very prominent around the world when we had the big um, coastal storms and cholera in Arabine with a swimming pool on the beach was worldwide uh, news. Um, it, there is clearly too much focus on open coast properties and assets. When you look at it, there are tens of thousands more in our estuaries and waterways than there are on the open coast. So the emphasis on inundation of the open coast is, is incorrect. It should be, the emphasis should be on the inundation and damages and flooding of properties around our estuaries and lakes, coastal lakes and lagoons. Okay, um, in the interest of time, we might have to make this the last one. Um, but Luke, you can let us know about timing. A uh, question here from Ingrid Lambert. Do you suspect a large difference in the range for predictive values in the new IPCC AR6 to be public, published next year uh, compared to the AR5? Um, 
Again, I think the only difference would be the possibility that there may be more discussion and more emphasis on, uh, I'm just going back through the slides. Can people see me going backwards? I don't know whether it's still there. We can see that, Ron. Yep. We can see okay. that, right? Okay. This particular slide, um, the sea level rise centimeter, centuries to mill millennia, which is the blue solid line, is based on thermal expansion. There's lots of discussion about ice melt and uh, loss of glaciers, and that's another extra item that can go on top of our sea level rise issue. There's been lots of people writing about that, and it could be that in the new AR6, there may be more emphasis because of our lack of action down here in the far left corner, because of our lack of action and controlling emissions, a lot of the people are concerned that we may kick in. There may be ice melting and several more early contributions from the ice melt components. Okay, um, there's a couple other questions here which uh, we haven't answered, but I might hand back to Luke now. I'm um, not sure how we might um, capture these questions and um, answer them outside of this session. Okay, well, look, we will, um, we will be doing something on our website going forward. I'll just give a, a bit of a general update. Thanks again first to, to Ron uh, for, for that, that great talk. And again, I think there's enough interest that we should be considering what the next step might be in terms of another presentation. Uh, thanks to Joel for your help with the questions there. Um, appreciate that. You can see we have had some uh, teething issues, guys. We are working on um, trying to make this a more regular feature. And in fact, uh, before COVID came around, we'd already been um, discussing as a board how we can better reach out to um, our various members in various places in Australia and New Zealand, uh, particularly those in regional areas. Um, and this is certainly a step in the right direction. So um, we had nearly 100 people sticking around for the questions. It's dropped to about 85 now, which is still really encouraging that people are interested. Uh, we do have plans to improve the amount of interaction that we can get out of something like this because um, uh, we've, in various surveys we've done, we understand that that's one of the most important things that people take out of their PIAC memberships. Um, look, before I sign out properly, um, keep an eye out for future events. We are going to ask the various regional chapters to try and cycle through and, um, and keep some interesting stuff going through the next few months. Um, I think people are crying out uh, for, for, for as much as they can get. Um, please do reach out to your regional chapters, even in this time when we can't meet in person. Um, I encourage you to reach out for the um, both the camaraderie, the, um, the, 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 the benefits for young people in your careers uh, is, is just um, it's huge, it's enormous, and the people you interact with. So I encourage you, if you haven't had direct contact with your local regional chapter, please do reach out and keep an eye out for it. Um, but again, thanks for both participating and thanks for sticking around. And um, we're going to have a recording that will be posted. So if you missed this or you want to pass it on to a friend or a colleague, um, then keep an eye out on the website. And we'll also be adding some sort of um, yet to be determined how we'll do this, but we're trying to get some sort of forum going that will allow the exchange of ideas and, and a few questions that are still outstanding from this talk will be a pretty good place to start. So if you haven't had your question answered, if it comes to you later, please do keep an eye out over the next week or two. Um, and we'll, we'll certainly have something up and running soon. So, Ron, I'm not sure there's anything else you want to say, but thanks again, and I uh, look forward to your, your next talk, whenever that might be. Thank you. Well, I'd just like to thank everybody for tuning in, and I hope I didn't bore you too much. So uh, that's all. <laughs>